Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the post notification bell so you will not miss a video when I post, guys. Um, don't forget to like up the video, share out the video, and let me get straight into the video today. Uh, Vibe Cartel was freed today. He was released and he was acquitted and he will not get a new trial. He is a free man. He is able to walk out into Jamaica. Yes, guys, he was free today. If you want to hear the hearing, take a listen. I have the full clip audio here. Um, the audio is really exciting to listen to. You get to hear a lot of the facts. You get to hear a lot of the reasons why he was free today, guys. So take a listen and drop some gems in the comment section. Let me know your thoughts. A lot of people are so happy. Gaza, everybody. A lot of people are happy. But also, he was free. He should be out celebrating. And um, you did hear from the judge that he does have some health issues. I don't know how severe. But he is a free man and he's no longer incarcerated or in prison. Take a look at, um, listen at this audio and let me know what you think. Sean Campbell, Adija Palmer, Kahira Jones, and Andre St. John. If it pleases you, Madam President. Yes, Sister Clark. It's a pleasure to address you as such, my lady. The, for the first time, the appearances, yes. congratulations, my lady. The appearances in this matter for the appellant, John Clark, Isa Buchanan, Alessandro Labiche, and Mr. Iqbal Chevrolet. For the Crown, we have Miss. Claudia Thompson, the acting director of public prosecution, Mr. Yannick Forbes, the assistant director, the assistant director, and Mr. Rashid Lee Crown Council are present today, and we're all here with bated breaths awaiting the court's judgment in this matter. Thank you, Council. On diverse days between the 10th and 18th of June, 2024, the court heard submissions from counsel in this matter regarding a retrial, that question of a retrial that was remitted from the Privy Council to this court. At the end of the submissions, we reserved our judgment and the court is now ready with with its decision. The decision of the court is unanimous and we have a judgment in writing which is still subject to editing in any event because we were trying to make the deadline. What we have done is to extract a summary of our reasons for the decision with the promise to release the full judgment as soon as possible. So what the court has today is a summary, which is in writing and will be released. And we have a disclaimer. This summary is provided for the sole purpose of assisting members of the public with understanding the Court of Appeals decision in this matter. It does not form part of the reasons for the court's decision and should not be used as a substitute for the judgment of the court which is the only authoritative record of the court's reasons. The full judgment of the court will be made available to counsel and through the court's website at www.courtofappeal.gov.j. On 13th March 2024, the appellants, Sean Campbell, also known as Sean Storm, Adija Palmer, also known as Vibes Cartel, 
and Kahira Jones and Andre St. John, also known as Madsus, were convicted of the murder of Clive Williams, also known as Lizard. The appellants appealed their convictions to the Court of Appeal and then to His Majesty in Council. On 14th March, 2024, 10 years and one day after they were convicted in the Supreme Court, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council recommended that the appellants' convictions be quashed. The Privy Council remitted to this court for determination the question of whether the appellants should be ordered to stand a new trial. Over six days, the court comprising Judges of Appeal MacDonald Bishop, P. Williams, and D. Fraser heard arguments by counsel for the appellants on the Crown on that question. The court has considered counsel's written and oral arguments as well as the authorities and evidence filed by both sides and has arrived at a unanimous decision. For a fulsome appreciation of the question remitted to this court for determination and the court's resolution of the issues and sub-issues raised by the parties relative to that, that question, an abbreviated summary of the background is provided. The allegations in the court below were that the deceased and Lamar Chow, the prosecution's sole eyewitness, had been given two unlicensed firearms belonging to Palmer for safekeeping. The appellant Palmer gave Lamar Chow and the deceased a deadline of 8 o'clock p.m. on 14th August 2011 to return them, with which they failed to comply. As a consequence, Lamar Chow and the deceased were summoned by the appellant Campbell to the appellant Palmer's house at Swallowfield Avenue, Havendale, which we call the Swallowfield premises. They went there by taxi on 16th August 2011, accompanied by Campbell, and on arrival were met by the appellants Palmer, Jones, and, and St. John. The appellant Palmer asked what plans Lamar Chow and the deceased had for replacing the firearms, to which the deceased replied that he would replace them. They were then both attacked, after which Chow saw the deceased lying motionless on the ground, with the appellant Jones bending over him. Lamar Chow escaped, but the deceased was never seen again, and calls to his mobile phone went unanswered. A team of police officers went to the Swallowfield premises to investigate the alleged homicide. They noticed that the house smelled of disinfectant. When the police returned to the premises on a subsequent visit, they found that the entire interior of the house had been destroyed by a fire. On a further police visit, it was discovered that the rear of the house had been demolished. The police dug at the premises, but did not find anything of significance to their investigations. The appellants were taken into custody on 30th September 2011 and subsequently charged for the deceased's murder. They have been detained ever since. The appellants were tried in the Home Circuit Court before Justice Campbell the trial judge sitting with a jury. The trial lasted 64 days. During the course of the trial, there were three incidents involving the jurors. The first and second incidents are not relevant to these proceedings and will therefore not be discussed. It suffices to state that after the second incident, the jury panel was reduced to 11 members. The third jury incident came to light on 13 March 2014, the last day of the trial judges summing up of the case to the jury. Following the report of possible jury misconduct, the trial judge convened a hearing in chambers and informed counsel on both sides that he had been made aware 
that a juror, who we call juror X, attempted to bribe another member of the jury with an offer of $500,000 to decide the case in a particular way. The trial judge and counsel on both sides questioned the four women of the jury in chambers. The four women informed them that juror X had spoken to all the jurors and encouraged them to free the appellants without regard to the evidence. There was no evidence to connect any of the appellants with the activities of juror X. Faced with the possibility of having to abort the trial, the trial judge heard submissions from the Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, and Defense Counsel. Despite Defense Counsel's resistance, the trial judge decided to continue with the summing up and handed the case over to the jury that evening. The jury deliberated for over three hours and by a majority of 10 to 1, convicted the appellants of the deceased murder on the same day. The appellants were each sentenced by the trial judge to imprisonment for life at hard labor with the stipulation that the appellants Campbell and Jones should serve a minimum of 25 years in prison before becoming eligible for parole. And the appellants Palmer and St. John should serve a minimum of 35 and 30 years respectively. The appellants were unsuccessful in their appeal to this court and appealed to the Privy Council. The Privy Council allowed the appellants appeal and quashed their convictions on the basis that the trial judge's treatment of the third incident of jury misconduct was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, giving rise to a miscarriage of justice. In the Privy Council's view, the trial judge should have done more to investigate the third incident of jury misconduct and not rely solely on the forewoman's account. Furthermore, allowing Jura X to continue to serve on the jury was fatal to the safety of the convictions and was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing by an independent and impartial court under Section 16 of the Constitution of Jamaica. Lastly, the fact that the prosecution was prepared to waive the irregularities in the trial did not absolve the trial judge of his responsibility to ensure a fair trial. In all the circumstances, the trial judge ought to have discharged the jury and ended the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. Against this background, the court has to determine whether the interests of justice require that the appellants be ordered to face a new trial or whether judgments and verdicts of acquittal should be entered. The, the court starts with the Constitution, which provides that Upon conviction, a person should not be tried for a second time unless a court of superior jurisdiction, which is the appellate court, orders that there be a retrial. The Constitution did not set out the circumstances in which the court should order a retrial. It is to case law that the court looks to determine what are the principles applicable to the question of whether there should be a retrial. The court looked at all the applicable legal principles governing the question of a new trial, which was set out most authoritatively by the Privy Council in the case of Reed against the Queen. We will not state the citation at this time, but that is in writing. The court also looks at other principles emanating from subsequent cases since Reed. And we have a, an amalgamated list of those factors. There are 12 factors that the court has considered. 
the seriousness and prevalence of the offense. That's one. Two, the strength of the prosecution's case. Three, the availability of the prosecution's witnesses and exhibits. Four, the av availability of the defense witnesses. Five, delay and whether a retrial can be facilitated within a reasonable time. Six, the time, financial costs, expense, and impact on the court's resources of a new trial if one is ordered. Seven, the ordeal to be faced by the appellants if a new trial is ordered. Eight, the impact of prejudicial publicity on the fairness of a new trial, if a new trial, the fairness of a new trial, sorry, if ordered. Nine, whether the new trial would give the prosecution an unfair advantage. Ten, changes in the Jury Act, 11, potential legislative changes in the sentence for murder, 12, the possibility of prejudice arising from the mandatory minimum sentence and minimum term before eligibility for parole. We have considered all the factors governing the court's determination of whether a new trial should be ordered and have given due regard to all the material, submissions, and evidence presented by the appellants and the Crown. We commence by stating that the egregious nature and seriousness of the offense in this case is beyond argument. So too is the prevalence of the offense of murder in Jamaica. We make bold to say that the features of this case bear every hallmark of a deliberate attack on and bareface defiance of law and order, involving allegations of transactions relating to illegal firearms, a killing in respect of which the body of the deceased has not been recovered, or should we say an alleged killing in which the body of the deceased has not been recovered, and interference with a crime scene while it was under the control of the police. The court is therefore satisfied that the nature, seriousness, and prevalence of the alleged offense in this case are powerful factors that weigh in favor of a retrial. The court, however, finds that there are several equally powerful factors which when combined militate against ordering a new trial. In summary, these factors are the insufficient and in inadequate account by the prosecution for the availability of its witnesses and trial exhibits. Witnesses and trial exhibits relied upon by the appellants, which tended to support their defense at their first trial are no unavailable or cannot be accounted for. Three, the appellant's trial in the Supreme Court was complex, lasting 64 days, and utilized a significant share of the court and the appellant's resources. Therefore, the time, financial costs, expense, and impact on the court's resources, as well as other cases in the queue awaiting trial, we find that this is significant and it militates against a new trial. Four, the psychological, financial, and um, medical effect that a new trial would likely have on the appellants who have already spent 13 years in custody which is demonstrated by medical and other affidavit evidence. We look at the medical problems relating to the appellant Palmer, which came through medical reports that stand unchallenged by the Crown and therefore speak to declining health in the penal institution. The court looks at the lapse of time between the commission of the alleged offense and the likely time in which a new trial would take place, 
which would in our estimation be at least 15 years, we find that to be inordinate. Six, the unjustifiable interference with the appellant's constitutional rights to a fair hearing within a reasonable time under section 16 of the Constitution of Jamaica and the potential for that breach or interference, we should say continuing if a new trial is ordered. We look at the potential prejudice to at least two of the appellants who, if convicted after a new trial, would be required to serve a longer term of imprisonment before eligibility for parole than that which was originally imposed upon them after their first trial due to the operation of the statutory mandatory minimum for the offense of murder. The court looks at other factors which it did not see swinging the pendulum either way and our judgment will explain it all. We find that this, the submissions regarding pretrial publicity did not assist the appellants. We find that pretrial publicity is such that you would have to prove that it is impossible to obtain a fair trial. And that question is one for the trial court. What the court did find coming out of the issue of pretrial publicity is if the mechanisms have to be employed as the, as the Crown had argued, that would add to the delay of the proceedings. As we have said, we have looked at all the other factors, but we find by now, having weighed everything in the balance, that the countervailing the weight is against a new trial. Our judgment will explain everything in depth, but as we say, this is for the decision for you to understand what the court has done. Having regard to all the considerations the court has taken into account, we conclude that the interests of justice do not require a new trial to be ordered for the appellants, and we therefore make the following order. Judgments and verdicts of acquittal are entered in relation to the appellants. We must, on the record, thank our judicial clerks, Mr. Jordan Jarrett, Mrs. Yumika Harris Mackenzie, and Mrs. Nicole McLennan, and Ms. Chanel Hunter. Had it not been for them, their assistance would not have been able to make the deadline given the workload of the court and the various things that we had to do over the past couple of weeks. So we give them the weight of the credit and we thank them wholeheartedly for their assistance. It leaves us to thank counsel on both sides for your spirited 